Good morning, everybody. Of course, the thing I forgot to do when I walked forward is I forgot to unmute my channel. So, yeah, I'm turned on, but I forgot to unmute it. So, button at the top of the slider for me. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. Do you know what? We were do I was doing my very best there, thinking all the things that have gone wrong are nothing to do with me. How wonderful and how unusual. And, uh, and that was my fault. Good morning, everybody. It's fantastic to be here this morning. It's fantastic to, to be led in worship by such a brilliant, brilliant band. I, I was stood at the back of the room with my heart just singing out to God. It's, it is, we are truly, truly blessed. The Lord has really blessed us. Um, especially since one of us is actually here on their birthday. So that's just amazing, amazing. Today my preaching comes, the, my, the starts at a point, actually right at the end of Jesus' life on earth. It's, it's as Jesus is, is in his final evening before the crucifixion. He's with the disciples. Um, he, he's washed their feet, um, including Judas, who went on to betray him. They've broken bread, including Judas, who went on to betray him. And then, then he explicit, explicitly tells them that his actions are a physical example of how they are to act. And then he says, in our, in our first verse, uh, is in John 13, 34, 35. Jesus says to the disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know you are my disciples. And as I was preparing for this, a couple of things, a couple of things struck me, it's almost a new, almost, I mean, I'd, I'd seen them before, but, it, but the, and the first thing that struck me new is, when Jesus says, a new command I give you, what command have they been working on until that point? I mean, a new command I give you, love one another. Have, have, they been doing, have they been living differently? Have they been doing something else? Have they been, what premise have they, have they been like hating each other? Have they been like, no, oh, no, I know we're disciples together, I don't like you. Or, I know we're disciples together, I don't like you. Have they, have, they, have they not been loving each other? Have they been blindly indifferent, a bit can't care less with each other? Or perhaps they've just been acting like school kids. You know, squabbling school kids are, and just vying for the teacher's attention. Me, 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 pick me, pick me. I mean, as you read the Gospels up until that point, they are a little bit like that. They are a bit, pick me, Lord, pick me, pick me. To the detriment of one another. Thinking that, it's like, like, almost thinking that, that in the new world order, sorry, I've got a hair in my mouth. In the new world order, Jesus is going to usher in. There's going, to be, there's going to be like the us at the top, lording it over the them at the bottom. Go if that's the case, if they've thought that, then Jesus washing their feet and saying, I've set you an example, do like I've done. It must have just like hold them below the waterline. It just, no, no, this new command, this new command Jesus gives is love. Agape. It's one of, the, it's one of the, the scriptural words for love. It's one of our favourite words for love. I read recently, I read agape described as unselfish love. And I don't think I ever, I don't think that, I don't think I ever read it as that before. I don't think I ever realised that, that definition of it before. I don't think I've ever seen it quite defined like that before. Agape is unselfish love. It's love that, that doesn't require a return, love that doesn't need a return, love that doesn't, isn't conditional on any return. It's just unselfish. And I love that. The other thing that struck me is, is Jesus is talking quite, quite specifically to the disciples. And disciples, disciples is one of those funny words. It's one of those words that, that is a bit, that you get chills up your back a little bit when people start talking about disciples and discipleship. Disciples aren't just people who believe Jesus existed. As he was talking about the earth 2,000 years ago, people saw him, they thought, oh, it's Jesus over there, right enough. I, yeah, he exists. He born in, in Bethlehem, Catholic, he chose the Catholic son. How fair enough. They weren't disciples, they were just folk. And there, there are people now who are, who are like that as well. The beliefs existed, but, but that belief doesn't doesn't affect their lives in any way. Not those people. 
and not just the fair weather believers who when Jesus teaches start to get a little bit difficult they didn't like that either and not the people who, who go to church because it's the right thing to do or, or social acceptable thing or just to get their ears tickled disciples are the ones who go through and with the teacher disciples are the ones who tread the same path who follow the same rivers cross the same deserts and share the same joys a disciple isn't only a pupil I, this is something I read, I'm going to have to read it properly. A disciple is not only a pupil, but an adherent. Hence they're spoken of as imitators of the teachers. Which is why Jesus says to them, says to the Jews who have believed him, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. That's from John 8. Taking his words and his actions as a whole, there is no doubt that Jesus calls people to discipleship, not just to belief or just to follow him. It's, it's, there's something more. And before I give you three beautifully illiterative, illiterative points for which I have to thank my wonderful wife. Because <laughs> I said, Joe, Joe, watch it. And she went, what did you say? Oh yeah, brilliant. Um, so I must say something particularly important that I don't think is said quite often enough. Discipleship is not digging coal out of the ground. Discipleship is not deep sea fishing, you know, that like, or, or even that, one of the things that we're watching on telly at the moment is this Aussie Outback Gold Hunters. Discipleship is not that. You don't have to be out in 40 degree heat with a metal detector. Discipleship isn't climbing mountains or running marathons or or it's not polar expedition. Discipleship isn't blood, sweat, tears and strife. It's not higher education or higher learning or higher thinking. It's not, discipleship is not something to be scared of or frightened by. Discipleship is something to be enjoyed, not something to be endured. And we think it, it, has tempt, it is tempting to think discipleship is hard work. And I said, I don't think anything could be further from the truth. I don't think anything could be further from the truth. Discipleship has a bad reputation, but in essence, it's just following Jesus where he leads you. That's it. Wherever he leads you, it's waking up every morning going, Lord, where are we going today? Is the essence of discipleship. And knowing that he leads us, means we're not even alone on the journey. We're not even alone wherever we're going because he's leading us there. It's not like he's staying over here and we're going over there. That's not discipleship. That's doing what you want. Discipleship is saying, Lord, where are we going? And Jesus going, I'm going over here. Right, crack on, I'm following you then. First nice alliterative point about discipleship is heart. You've got to want it with all your heart. You've got to want to follow him with all your heart. So if you think, oh, wow, this discipleship thing, that sounds like something for me, examine your heart. Do you really want it? Do you really want it? Do you really mean it rather than just think you mean it? For example, I would love to play a musical instrument. I, am, I come here every week and I'm jealous of the skills of the men on stage, the people on stage, I really am. I love to play a musical instrument, but do I really mean it with all my heart? Because <laughs> if I did, I would spend an awful lot more time with the piano and a number of guitars that currently live at my house. I'd spend an awful lot more time with them and an awful lot less time with comic books and Netflix. Because <laughs> I'm guessing that to get that good on a guitar, or that good on a guitar or piano, or this good on a bass, or this good on drums, I'm guessing that you can't spend all your life reading comic books and playing and watching Netflix. I, <laughs> I appreciate you can spend some of it once you get to a certain level, but I know that you guys have put an awful, about a lot of hours in practicing. You've got to decide that. You've got to see that and think, that's what I want to do. 
in my heart that's what I want to do because if you don't want it in your heart you'll be like me when I was I, I started learning to play the violin and I didn't want to do it with all my heart and as soon as I got the chance to stop I stopped I think how to how to make sure it's the right thing is to a good place to start is to echo the prayer of David in Psalm 139 and the next verse is going to come up as well David, David in Psalm 139 says, Search my heart, test my thoughts, lead me in the way. Search my heart. Let's go to God. If you, if you, if you think, oh, this discipleship thing sounds great, like a great idea, go to God. Search my, pray, search my heart, test my thoughts, and then lead me in the right way. Second nice alliterative point. After heart is head. Heart, head. Head. Once we decide that we really, really, really do want to do it, then we have to decide how we do it. And I think this is another, another thing that, that makes discipleship a slightly worrying word. It's because we forget that our critical discipleship pathway is unique to us. And everyone's discipleship is, is their own way. So, and, and of course it is. Of course it is. We are all different. Why would our discipleship be the same if we're different? For it to mix metaphors slightly. You wouldn't accept, expect the discipleship of an eye to be the same as the discipleship of an ear. You wouldn't expect the discipleship of a foot to be the same as the discipleship of a hand. Except in the very loosest definition of the word, the same, you're following the same teacher. When Jesus says in Luke 14, 27, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be disciple, cannot be my disciple, he knew, and we surely must know, that all our crosses are different. We are all different people, we're all called to different things, we're all called... To, to do different things in our lives. We're not called to be automatons. We don't all dress the same. We don't all, all... I nearly said something really rude about... Anyway. We don't all dress the same. We don't all think the same. We, we don't all speak the same. Paul and I were talking at the start about one of the wonderful things we think about our church is, is we get different voices. We get different voices leading us here. We get different voices here. How, how on earth, knowing all that, would we think that our discipleship was all going to be the same? My discipleship, my discipleship is mine. Yours is not like mine. Jesus goes straight on after that. My discipleship, kind of, kind of, um, take up your cross and follow me. In Luke 14, 28. It says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? And I think what Jesus is saying there is think about what I'm wanting you to do. Think about how I want you to do it. Not how I want me to do it. Not how I want Neil to do it. Not how I want Paul to do it. Or Rob or, or Dave or Ben or, or Annie for that matter. Not how you want any of that. How you want to don't think, oh, Rob's doing this, that, the other. I think that's what he wants me to do. But no, he doesn't. He wants you to do what he wants you to do. I think that our Father gave us good minds, good brains, and good heads, so we could use them. How do we manage this discipleship? Third nice alliterative point, thanks to Joe, is head, heart, and hands. All the desires and plans in the world, all the buying guitars and reading the books in the world will not do anything and mean less than nothing if we don't actually do something about it. If we don't actually get our hands mucky and work at it and do it. So what are God's desires that we do? What does God desire that we do to, follow, to be a disciple of him? Well, there was a big clue earlier. Love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. 
Do you know, Jesus said, this command I give you. Do you know what part of being a disciple is following his commands? This command I give you, love one another. With that unselfish love. And <laughs> that's, that's, it, sounds, it sounds really simple. As a, as a starting place to start off, it sounds really simple, and it is really simple. But simple and easy are not synonyms. And it's, it's important that we understand that as well and don't kill ourselves when somebody annoys the living daylights out of us. When, when, when I annoy the living daylights out of you. Because I will. Because I, I annoy me sometimes and I love me. How I wouldn't annoy you, I don't know. It is a simple place to start, but it's not easy. And, and no, it's not easy. And the Lord knows it's not easy. Jesus gives us another big clue on how, how, to, how the outworking of our discipleship should manifest itself. In Matthew 25, 35, 36, I'm going to have to read this from the page because I can't remember it off heart. Jesus says, I was, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was, I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. How, how, how do we work out with our hands this discipleship that our heart and our head want to do? It's by doing. It's by doing. Again, Jesus, Jesus' final words to the disciples Final, final words. Therefore, go and make disciples, make other disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. That's it's stuff. What does he want us to do as disciples? Is stuff, is things. And that's, and again, I can't emphasize this enough. Our walk as disciples is our walk as disciples. And if the thing he calls you to do is go and feed the poor, go and be in food bank, because do you know what? When you read that, and when I read that, when he says, I was hungry, gave me something to eat, afterwards, the next line is, and the people said, so what when we did we do that? And Jesus says, it's when you helped the food bank. Oh, oh okay. Oh, okay. I was a stranger and you invited me in. It's, it's doing. Discipleship isn't just sitting at home and thinking about it. Discipleship is doing something about it. Go out into the world. Be his hands and his feet. And his heart and his mouthpiece. And his loving representatives. Where he sends you where he wants you to go. And if he wants you to be, I don't know, if he wants you to be an intercessor, one of those prayer warriors, one of those people who just, their hearts burn for praying for people, your discipleship in that is going to be very different than if he wants you to be somebody that stands here and does this. Or somebody that, I don't know, goes out on the mission field. Or, or does food bank. It's going to be different. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why, why do we talk about being a disciple as opposed to being just a follower, as opposed to being a believer? Why? It matters because it's the thing that makes God's love complete in us. The, there's a verse in 1 John, 1 John 4, 11 is going to come up again. 1 John 4, 11 and 12. John, who was a disciple, who was one of Jesus' disciples, writes to the church, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And that complete, 
That complete means brought into full expression, into full maturity, run its full course. It's perfected, he knows. Have you ever done something? Have you ever done a jigsaw and, and, and stopped halfway through? Or, or, or one of my favourite things to do, I must confess. Have you ever been sat watching a film fairly late at night and fall asleep halfway through? And then woken up, not halfway through the next programme, but halfway through the programme after that. And that, that feeling of like, I've missed something there. I've, 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 I've got a start of it. And I understand, I understand they kidnapped his daughter and he, 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 sort of, he, went, to, he went to Europe after her. But I've, but I've no idea what happened after that. That, that. I've missed something. But I think it's that way with God's love if we are just listeners and not doers. If we're just people who, who hear the word and don't act on the word, we just, we've watched the first half of the film, and it's great, and you know, the first half of the film is a great half of the film. And knowing that God loves you is, is, is brilliant. And understanding that God loves you is brilliant. It really is. When you have that revelation that there's a Father in heaven who cares about you, that's just incredible. But it's not everything until you start giving that out. It's not complete until you start loving one another. It's not complete until you walk and follow Jesus. And when you start that walk, you realise, oh, hang on a minute, there's more to this. As brilliant as the revelation was that we have a Father that loves us, we complete that love by walking it out. By our walk. Only as loving disciples can we finally feel fulfilled. Guys, you can come back up now. Um, finally, finally, if, if, if this has left you fe feeling discouraged about your discipleship walk, if, rather, rather than the encourage I was trying for, Then remember, we're all a work in progress. Our Father doesn't expect perfection of us. He expects us to strive for our best. But he doesn't expect perfection. And he doesn't expect us all to get it right all the time. Paul writes to the church in Colossae. Therefore, as God's chosen people, God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. Bear with one another. Bear with one another. And he's talking about having patience and bearing with ourselves there as well. If I'm talking about discipleship and you think, oh, no, I'm not doing very well, have compassion on yourself. Bear with yourself. If you find it hard to follow Jesus, if you, if you find it hard to get up in the morning and say, Lord, where are we going today? Bear with yourself. It's what he wants you to do as well. If all this didn't make any sense to you, if, 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 you haven't, if you're not a disciple, if you're just somebody that thinks Jesus might have existed, you can come into his presence. You can know that, that love of the Father God that I was talking about. That, that incredible infilling of joy when you realise that, that the Father in heaven is nothing like my Father. The Father in heaven is a perfect Father. When you realise that, when you realise that Jesus wasn't just somebody that talked around and had some good ideas, but he's the one that, he's Emmanuel, God with us, the God incarnate on earth, who came to earth for us, for our failings. When you realise that the Holy Spirit can dwell in you and give you an 
a fire that burns inside that can't be quenched. You can have that. If you don't know that, you can have it. And the empowerment to, to love one another unselfishly that I was talking about. That's a possibility. You can have that. And all you have to do is ask. With all your heart, all you have to do is ask. There's a prayer that, that we pray when, when, we, when we want to ask Jesus into our lives, when we want to surrender our lives to him, there's a prayer we pray. And we pray this prayer at times as well when, when we realise, oh, hang on a minute, I've, I've been doing my thing and not his thing a bit. So I'm going to pray this prayer and please pray along. And at the end when I say amen, say amen, comment on the Facebook feed, praying hands, and then we'll, we'll drop out to worship. But if that is you, then please tell us. Please contact us. There'll be contact details on the screen. Please tell us. I'm going to read this prayer now. The prayer says, Lord Jesus, I know, thing, I know I have done things wrong in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. There are so many good things I have not done, so many wrong things I have done. I'm sorry for all those wrong things and I turn from everything I know to be bad. You gave your life for me on a cross and gratefully I give my life back to you. Now I ask you to come into my life. Come in as my saviour to clean me. Come in as my Lord to lead me. And I will serve you all the remaining days of my life. Amen. As I say, if you, if you prayed that prayer, Please contact us, please contact the church. Someone will get back to you and explain to you more about how your discipleship, your following Jesus, is actually the best thing in the world to do.